Hey guys and welcome to Respect Your Intellect. I'm John and in this video we'll be going over the history of our most important astronomical discoveries that showed us what our place is in the universe and how we harness this knowledge. Let's get started! At this point of our scientific evolution, it's very easy to become detached from our history. We now have a long and rich history of nearly 3,000 years of scientific advancement through discoveries that, every time they happen, revolutionized or solidified our understanding of our place in the universe. In the more recent years, we've also been able to harness this knowledge to create technology to improve our lives as well as deepen our understanding even further. So I wanted to take the time to put all this proud history in one video so that we can remind ourselves of where we came from. There's a lot of accomplishments to go through, so let's just dive into it. Let's start with 750 BC. Mayan astronomers discovered an 18.6 year cycle in the rising and setting of the moon. Using this, they created the first tables of movements of the sun, moon, and planets for use in astrology. Later, this knowledge was used to predict eclipses. In 585 BC, Thales became the first to predict a solar eclipse. In 500 BC, Pythagoras was the first to propose that the Earth is spherical in shape. In 467 BC, Anaxagoras was the first to come to the correct explanation for eclipses. He also described the sun as a fiery mass larger than Peloponnese. He also attempted to explain rainbows and meteors, and he was the first to explain that the moon shines due to reflected light from the sun. Around 400 BC, Babylonians used the zodiac to divide the heavens into 12 equal segments of 30 degrees each to better record and communicate information about the position of celestial bodies. In 387 BC, Greek philosopher Plato founded the Platonic Academy School, which influenced the next 2000 years. It promotes the idea that everything in the universe moves in harmony and that the sun, moon, and planets move around the earth in perfect circles. We know this today as the geocentric model. Even though he believed the earth to be at the center of the universe, he was teaching that the shape of the earth was a sphere. Around 350 BC, Aristotle declared that the earth was a sphere. This was based on the constellations changing as you traveled further away from the equator, like stars in Egypt and Cyprus that can't be seen in northerly regions. He also estimated that the Earth would not be of a great size, otherwise these things would not be quickly apparent. He also said that with every portion of the Earth tending to want to go towards the center, this convergence will form a sphere. He also observed that the shadow of the Earth on the Moon during a lunar eclipse is always round rather than sometimes being linear or oval in shape. In 270 BC, Aristarchus of Samos was the first to propose the heliocentric model as an alternative to geocentrism. This placed the Sun at the center rather than the Earth and that the Earth was just another planet orbiting it. At this time, the heliocentric model wasn't taken very seriously. In 240 BC, Chinese astronomers made the first recording of Halley's Comet. The records that were taken here is what allowed astronomers today to predict accurately how the comet's orbit changes over the centuries. During that year, Eratosthenes was also the first to estimate Earth's circumference. He heard that in Syene, the sun was directly overhead at the summer solstice, but in Alexandria, the sun was still casting shadows. With the shadows in Alexandria being cast at about 7 degrees, he calculated that it was about 1 50th of a circle. With the distance between the two points, multiplying by 50 gave him the first estimate of the circumference of the Earth that is within a few percent of today's accepted value. It's worth noting that at the time his experiment only worked under the assumption that the sun was far enough away that the sun rays would all be nearly parallel. In the 2nd century BC, Hipparchus was the first to use parallax to measure the distance to the moon and the sun. To see an example of parallax, you can hold your thumb up at arm's length uh, under a light switch on the wall 6 feet away or more. By looking at it with only one eye and alternating quickly, you can see the movement of your thumb appear to move a greater distance than the light switch on the wall in the background. Stellar parallax uses Earth's orbit around the Sun to act like the two eyes by making two measurements six months apart and comparing against the fixed background stars. This method is so precise that it established a framework for measuring the scale of the universe. Around 100 BC, Posidonius used Eratosthenes' method to measure Earth's circumference by using the star Canopus instead of the Sun. This result was favored over Eratosthenes. Posidonius also expressed the distance to the Sun in Earth radii. 
During the Roman Empire, the idea of a spherical Earth along with much of the Greek teaching slowly spread throughout the globe and ultimately became the accepted view in all major astronomical endeavors. In 4 BC, astronomer Shi Shen is believed to have catalogued 809 stars in 122 constellations, as well as making the earliest observation of sunspots. In 140 AD, Ptolemy published his star catalog with 48 constellations and the geocentric model with Earth as the center of the universe. These views were not debated for almost 1500 years and were passed down to Arabic and medieval European astronomers in his book Almagest. In this book, he also observed that mountains across a body of water seemed as if the mountains rose directly from the sea, indicating that the bottom was hidden behind the curved surface of the sea. In the 3rd century AD, educated Christian authors were all well aware of the spherical shape of the Earth. In the year 400, the Hindu cosmological time cycles calculated the average length of a year to be only 1.4 seconds longer than today's accepted value. This remained the most accurate calculation for over 1,000 years. In the year 499, Indian mathematician astronomer Aryabhata first identifies the force of gravity by saying it's the Earth's nature to attract and keep heavy things, in the same way that it's fire's nature to burn and water's nature to flow. He still worked under the geocentric model, but he also proposed that the planets spin on their axes and follow elliptical orbits. This was significant because it was the first thing to propose that things in the heavens might not be as perfect as we previously imagined. He also wrote that the planets and the moon don't have their own light but instead reflect the light from the sun, that the earth rotates on its axis causing day and night, and that the sun rotates around earth to cause years. In the year 628, Indian mathematician astronomer Brahmagupta first recognized gravity as a force of attraction and briefly described Newton's second law of universal gravitation. He came up with methods of calculating the motions and places of various planets, their risings and settings, conjunctions, as well as calculations for solar and lunar eclipses. From the 8th century forward, no cosmologist worthy of note has ever called into question the sphericity of the Earth. In the years 773 and 777, various translations were made of the work done up to now, which propagated the current knowledge. In the year 850, revisions were made by Al-Farhani. One revision is for the obliquity of the ecliptic, which is a fancy way of saying our axis of rotation in relation to our orbital plane. Another revision was the precessional movement of the apogees of the sun and the moon, which is essentially the gradual change of which direction the axis of rotation is pointing to in space over a period of 25,772 years. And he also revised the circumference of the earth. In the year 928, Mohammed al-Fazari constructed the earliest astrolab that still survives today. Those were the most advanced instruments of their time and allowed them to measure the positions of stars and planets and compile the most detailed almanacs and star atlases up until this point. In 1031, Abu Said Sinjari suggested the possible heliocentric movement of the Earth around the Sun. In 1054, Chinese astronomers and Native American rock carvings show a very bright star near the moon in the sky. This star was the Crab supernova exploding. In 1070, many astronomers started working on explaining the problems and inconsistencies with the current geocentric model. In 1126, a translation to Latin was made on the current Indian and Islamic works and those ideas were introduced to the European astronomers. In 1150, a very significant advancement was made by mathematician astronomer Bhaskara II. He calculated the longitudes and latitudes of the planets, lunar and solar eclipses, risings and settings, the moon's lunar crescent, conjunctions of the planets with each other and with the fixed stars, and he explained three problems with having everything rotating around the Earth. In 1250, the Erdi Lemma was developed, which will be later used in the Copernican heliocentric model. In 1350, a system was proposed that was close to geocentric, but not quite. It was demonstrated trigonometrically that the Earth was not the exact center of the universe. This rectification will also later be used in the Copernican model. Jump forward to 1543, Nicholas Copernicus published his theory that the Earth orbits the Sun after centuries of resistance to the heliocentric model. This fixed a lot of the problems of the geocentric model where some events were impossible to explain on an unmoving Earth. He published his model with perfect circular motions around the Sun as Plato suggested, so his theory was overcomplicated. However, this change was a revolution and forced a change in our worldview. 
1572, a very bright supernova named SN 1572, which they thought was a comet inside the atmosphere at the time, was recorded by Tycho Brahe. He observed that it was missing the expected parallax for it to be sublunar and was therefore beyond the atmosphere and beyond the moon. This was a very significant discovery. In 1608, a Dutch eyeglass maker named Hans Lippershey tried to patent a refracting telescope. That's our earliest historical record of one. This invention spread like wildfire across Europe and scientists began to make their own instruments. Their subsequent discoveries started a revolution in astronomy. In 1609, Johannes Kepler published his Three Laws of Planetary Motion and replaced Plato's perfect circular orbits with elliptical ones. The almanacs that were based on this new information were highly accurate. In 1610, Galileo published the observations he made using the telescope he built himself. This included sunspots, craters on the moon, four moons around Jupiter, and that Venus has phases. The imperfect things like the sunspots and the craters proved that the heavens were not as perfect as everyone had thought previously. The moons around Jupiter proved that not everything orbits around the Earth and Venus changing size with its phases is impossible in a geocentric model because it would always be the same distance from the Earth. With these discoveries, he started promoting the Copernican model that had the Sun at the center of the universe. In 1655, telescope power and quality increased significantly and allowed Christian Huygens to study Saturn and discover its largest moon, Titan. He also explained that Saturn seemed to be surrounded by a thin ring. In 1663, Scottish astronomer James Gregory described his Gregorian reflecting telescope that uses mirrors instead of lenses to reduce chromatic and spherical aberrations, but he was unable to build one. In 1668, Isaac Newton built the very first reflecting telescope, the Newtonian telescope. In 1687, Isaac Newton published his Principia and established the theory of gravitation and the laws of motion. The Principia explains Kepler's laws of planetary motion and allows astronomers to understand the forces acting between the Sun, the planets, and their moons. In 1705, Edmund Halley calculated that the comets that were recorded at 76-year intervals were actually the same comet and makes a prediction that it'll be back in 1758. His prediction was confirmed when the comet reappeared and was named Halley's Comet in his honor. In 1750, French astronomer Nicolas de la Caille sailed to the Southern Oceans to make the first catalog of the Southern Sky with over 10,000 stars cataloged. Others had seen the Southern Sky before, but his was the first comprehensive catalog. During that year, Thomas Wright also correctly speculated that the Milky Way might be a body of a huge amount of stars that are held together by gravitational forces and rotating around the galactic center. In 1761, the sun's distance was measured by astronomers from all over the world during a transit of Venus. The process in which to do this was outlined by Halley, who by the time realized this method would work, was too old to carry it out himself. Transits of Venus are once in a lifetime rare, but they always come in pairs eight years apart. So the measurements were repeated eight years later and the combined result gave us a distance that was within 3% of today's accepted value. This improved value meant that we could now be much more accurate with our stellar parallax measurements and it revealed a seemingly unending universe. This would also eventually lead to the discovery that our universe is billions of years old. In 1781, William Herschel discovered Uranus, though he thought it was a comet at first. Saturn was known as the most distant planet since the ancient times, but Uranus was the first planet to be discovered beyond Saturn. In 1784, Charles Messier published his catalog of nebulas and star clusters, which became the standard reference and is still in use today. In 1800, William Herschel split sunlight through a prism to measure the different temperatures of the colors of the visual spectrum. With a thermometer outside the visual spectrum, which he believed was the control and would remain at room temperature, he saw that the temperature was higher than room temperature and discovered the invisible infrared light beyond the red end of the spectrum. He then laid the foundations for spectroscopy. In 1801, Italian astronomer Giuseppe Piazzi discovered what he believed was a new planet between Mars and Jupiter and named it Ceres. 
William Herschel then proceeded to prove that it was very small and not a planet, so he proposed the name Asteroid. Soon after that, more of them were found. Today, we know that Ceres is 932 kilometers in diameter, and it's the 33rd largest object in the solar system. It's composed of rock and ice, and is estimated to have the mass of about one-third of the entire asteroid belt. Ceres is also the only object in the asteroid belt to have been rounded under its own gravity. In 1814, an incredible discovery was made by Joseph von Fraunhofer. He built the first spectrometer and used it to study the spectrum of the sun's light. He discovered that there were many dark lines across the spectrum where colors were missing. These dark lines correspond to the chemical elements in the sun's atmosphere, and he proceeded to map everything he could. Spectroscopy then became a method for studying what stars are made of. In 1838, Friedrich Bessel successfully used stellar parallax to calculate the distance to the star 61 Cygni. This was the first star other than the Sun to have its distance from Earth measured. In 1843, Heinrich Schwabe discovers after 17 years of studying the Sun that there was a regular cycle in sunspot numbers. This was the first clue of the Sun's internal structure. In 1845, Jean Foucault and Armand Fizeau take the first detailed photographs of the Sun's surface through a telescope. This was the birth of scientific astrophotography. In less than five years, the first detailed photograph of the Moon was also made. The film used to take pictures at the time wasn't yet sensitive enough to capture stars, though. In 1846, German astronomer Johann Gottfried Galle confirmed a prediction made by Urbain Le Verrier. Urbain calculated the position and size of a planet by using the effects of the gravity pole on the orbit of Uranus. John Couch Adams also made a similar prediction a year before. What Gottfried found that was predicted by Urbain was Neptune. It's awesome to think that we found this planet by using science and math before making an observation of it. In 1868, astronomers found a new emission line in the sun's spectrum during an eclipse. This emission line is caused by elements giving out light and was an element not found on Earth. He called it helium, which is the Greek word for sun. Almost 30 years later, helium was found on Earth. In 1872, American astronomer Henry Draper took the first photographs of the spectrum of the star Vega and showed the absorption lines that revealed its chemical makeup. At this point, astronomers began to realize that spectroscopy is the key to understanding how stars evolve. In the same year, William Huggins also used absorption lines to measure the redshift of stars to get the first indication of how stars are moving in relation to us. In 1895, Konstantin Tsiolkovsky published his article on the possibility of spaceflight. He discovered that a rocket, unlike other types of propulsion, will work in a vacuum. With this, he also outlined the principles of a multi-stage launch vehicle. In 1901, Annie Jump Cannon proposed classifying the stars in the Henry Draper catalog by the absorption lines of their spectrum. This was priceless and is still in use today. In 1906, Einar Hertzsprung established the standard for measuring the true brightness of a star. He showed that 90% of the stars in the Milky Way have a relationship between color and magnitude. A diagram of this was published in 1913, and astronomers argued about the order in which they evolved until 1924 when Arthur Eddington settled the controversy. In 1912, Henrietta Swan Leavitt discovered the period luminosity for Cepheid variables. Those are stars that pulsate in brightness in a standard way, which allows us to use them to calculate distances to very distant stars or even galaxies. This opened up a whole new branch of possibilities for measuring across even extragalactic distances. In 1916, German physicist Karl Schwarzschild used Albert Einstein's general theory of relativity to lay the foundation of the black hole theory. He suggested that some stars might collapse to a small enough size that no form of radiation would be able to escape its gravity, including light. In 1917, Heber Doust Curtis observed a supernova within what was then called the Andromeda Nebula. He then searched older records and found 11 more supernovae. He noticed that they were all much fainter than the ones we see in our own galaxy and estimated Andromeda to be about 500,000 light years away, which was quite a bit short of the real figure, but still outside our own galaxy. In 1923, Edwin Hubble discovered a Cepheid variable star in the Andromeda galaxy and proved that Andromeda and other nebulas are far beyond our own galaxy. By 1925, he even produced a classification system for galaxies. 
processes. In 1925, Cecilia Pengapashkin discovered that hydrogen is the most abundant element in the sun's atmosphere, as well as the most abundant element in the universe. This was done by relating the spectral classes of stars to their temperatures and applying an ionization theory developed by Indian physicist Meghnad Saha. This allowed future astronomers to study stellar atmospheres and chemical abundances and allowed us to understand the chemical evolution of the universe. In 1926, Robert Goddard made the first rocket powered by liquid fuel and demonstrated that it works in a vacuum. Later, his rockets broke the sound barrier for the first time. In 1929, Edwin Hubble discovered that the universe is expanding and that the farther away a galaxy is, the faster it's moving away from us. Two years later, Georges Lemaitre also proposed that this expansion can be traced back to an explosion event that we call the Big Bang. In 1930, Kleist Tombo discovered Pluto. It was so dim and so slow that he had to compare photos taken several nights apart. In the same year, a prediction was made that white dwarf stars of 1.44 solar masses or more would have its atoms disintegrate. Three years later, neutron stars were described as the result of this collapse and that it would cause a supernova. In 1932, Carl Jansky discovered the first radio waves to come from space. Radio waves from the Sun were detected in 1942 and radio waves from the Crab Nebula were discovered in 1949. In 1938, German physicist Hans Beth explained how stars generate energy. He explained that the nuclear fusion reactions created a series of heavier elements, created an enormous amount of energy, and allowed stars to very slowly use their hydrogen, allowing them to burn for billions of years. In 1944, German scientists developed the first rocket-powered ballistic missile. In 1948, the largest telescope in the world was built with a 200-inch mirror. This is pushing the technology to its limits because any bigger in the mirror would start to bend under its own weight. In 1957, Sputnik 1, the first artificial satellite, was launched by Russia. The US launched its first satellite, Explorer 1, four months later. In 1958, NASA was created to catch up to the Soviet space technologies. In 1959, both Russia and the US launched space probes to the moon, but NASA's pioneer probes all failed. Russian Luna 2 crashed on the moon's surface, but Luna 3 returned with the first pictures of the moon's far side. In 1961, Russia took the lead in the space race when Yuri Gagarin became the first person to orbit the Earth. NASA's Alan Shepard became the first American to go to space, but didn't achieve orbit. However, he was the first person to land while still in a spacecraft, which is considered to be the first complete human spaceflight. John Glenn achieved orbit in early 1962. In 1962, Mariner 2 became the first probe to reach another planet and flies past Venus. NASA continued with Mariner 4 that went to Mars in 1965, and both Russia and the US continued to send probes throughout the 60s and the 70s. In 1963, Dutch-American astronomer Martin Schmidt measured the spectra of quasars which were star-like radio sources discovered in 1960. He established that quasars are active galaxies and among the most distant objects in the universe. In 1965, Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson discovered a weak radio signal coming from anywhere you point in the sky. This was soon recognized as the remnant of the Big Bang over 13 billion years ago and became known as the cosmic microwave background. This radio signal comes from the flipping of the electron in hydrogen from spin up or down. This flipping occurs in hydrogen about once every million years for each particle. Since hydrogen is everywhere in the universe, including interstellar space gas throughout the entire universe, the sheer amount of them means it's detectable regardless of where you point to. However, this signal is much better seen when pointing to uh, the best source, which are dense nebulae. In 1966, the Russian Luna 9 made the first landing on the moon. In 1967, the first pulsar was detected. Pulsars emit regular pulses of radio waves. Eventually, pulsars were recognized as rapidly spinning neutron stars with intense magnetic fields, and neutron stars are remains of a supernova. In 1968, Apollo 8 was the first human spaceflight mission to feel the gravity of another celestial body and to orbit it. In 1969, the US won the race to the moon as Neil Armstrong stepped on the lunar surface on July 20th. Apollo 11 was then followed by five other landing missions, three of which carried rover vehicles. In 1970, the Uhuru satellite mapped the sky at X-ray wavelengths. We had already found X-rays from the Sun and a few other stars, but Uhuru was able to chart over 300 X-ray sources, including several possible black holes. 
In 1971, Russia launched its first space station, Salyut 1, in orbit. It was then followed by a series of other stations resulting in Mir in 1986. Having a space station in orbit allowed us to carry out much more serious research as well as new duration records for space flights. In 1972, Charles Thomas Bolton became the first astronomer to present irrefutable evidence of the existence of a black hole. He did this by observing a star wobble as if it was orbiting around an invisible object that was emitting powerful x-rays. Further analysis was made and the mass needed to create the gravitational pull was calculated and was proven to be too much for a neutron star. More observations were made until 1973 where the results were eventually confirmed. This black hole is now recognized the black hole Cygnus X1. During that year, the blue marble picture of the entire Earth was also taken from Apollo 17 at a distance of 29,000 kilometers or 18,000 miles. That picture became one of the most reproduced in history. In 1975, the Russian probe Venera 9 lands on the surface of Venus and sends the first pictures of the surface. Venera 7 was the first to land there, but it wasn't equipped with a camera. Both of them lasted less than an hour on the surface before breaking down in the toxic atmosphere. In 1976, two NASA probes arrived at Mars. These probes had an orbiter designed to take pictures from above and a lander designed to land and analyze the surface and search for life. In 1977, Voyager 1 and 2 were launched to study the moons of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, as well as the Kuiper Belt, the Heliosphere, and interstellar space. In 1981, NASA's Columbia made its first spaceflight and was the first reusable space shuttle. This made space travel much more routine and eventually allowed us to create the International Space Station. In 1983, the first infrared astronomy satellite, IRIS, was launched. It was able to operate for 300 days before its supply of liquid helium ran out. It was able to map 98% of the sky during this time. In 1986, NASA's space program came to a halt after Challenger exploded shortly after launch. The investigations that followed kept the shuttles on the ground for three years. During that year, Halley's Comet also returned and was greeted by five probes from Russia, Japan and Europe. Europe's Giotto spacecraft flew through the comet's coma, which is the small envelope surrounding the nucleus. In 1990, NASA's Magellan probe arrived at Venus and proceeded to mapping the planet with radar for three years. This technology became a wave of probes that were also launched. The Galileo arrived at Jupiter in 1995 and the Cassini arrived at Saturn in 2004. During that year, the Hubble Space Telescope was also launched with the Space Shuttle. Unfortunately, astronomers soon found that there was a problem with its mirror and a complex repair mission had to follow in 1993. Once fixed, this telescope started to produce spectacular images of distant stars, nebulae, and galaxies. In 1992, the Cosmic Background Explorer satellite produced a detailed map of the radiation left over after the Big Bang. The clusters and voids found on this map show the varying density of the early universe and correspond to the galaxies and clusters of galaxies that we see today. During that year, the Keck telescope was also completed at the peak of Mauna Kea in Hawaii. This was a revolutionary telescope that used 36 segments for the mirror and were all controlled by computers for alignment. In 1998, construction of the International Space Station began. It was a joint venture between many countries, including former rivals, US and Russia. In 2005, Mike Brown discovered another large body in the outer solar system. At first, it looked bigger than Pluto and was named temporarily as 10th planet. This body will later be named Eris. In 2006, the International Astronomical Union came up with a new definition of what a planet is, and they also introduced the new dwarf planet class. Pluto was demoted to a dwarf planet along with Ceres and Eris. In 2008, we discovered and tracked the first meteoroid headed towards Earth before the impact. In 2012, the first visual proof of a black hole was published. The image was a supermassive black hole 2.7 million light years away and it's currently swallowing a red giant star. In 2015, NASA's New Horizon spacecraft successfully encountered Pluto, which resulted in the US being the first country to explore all nine planets recognized in 1981. Later that year, LIGO was also the first to directly detect gravitational waves. 
In 2016, Proxima Centauri b was discovered around Proxima Centauri. This made it the closest known exoplanet to our solar system as of 2016. In 2017, a neutron star collision that happened in the NGC 4993 galaxy created gravitational waves that were detected by the LIGO-Virgo collaboration. This was predicted by Einstein 100 years earlier on the basis of his general theory of relativity. This detection was also complemented by multiple other observations. 1.7 seconds later, gamma ray bursts were detected by the Gamma Ray Space Telescope and Integral. 11 hours later, the Hubble Space Telescope, the Dark Energy Camera, and the Las Campanas observatory also detected it in the visual spectrum. Ultraviolet was detected by the Swift Gamma Ray Burst Mission. X-rays were detected by the Chandra X-ray Observatory. And radio waves were detected by the Carl G. Jansky Very Large Array. This was the first gravitational wave to show a simultaneous electromagnetic signal, so it was a significant breakthrough for multi-messenger astronomy. And in 2019, China's Chang'e 4 became the first spacecraft to softly land on the moon's far side. Now, I know this took a little while to go through, but if you're still watching at this point, it might be because you have the same level of pride as I do in our rich history of accomplishments. The amount of things that were theorized and proven became such an impressive pyramid of knowledge that I feel very lucky that these people all paved the way for us. I just wish that less people today would be willing to throw all this away because this is much more beautiful and elegant than any form of self-elevation. Just like we eventually got rid of the faulty geocentric model, some people today will have to get rid of their egocentric model. If you like this video and want more content like this, please like and subscribe. And if you have any suggestions about what you'd like to talk about, put it down in the comments below or come follow me on Twitter or Facebook. Links are in the description. Until next time, thanks for watching and remember, respect your intellect.